Well, thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm very happy both to be able to speak here and also uh, to have been able to sp spend this year visiting uh, Paris and, and Annes through the Data Science Chair. So I'm going to talk today about the type of research I do, which is largely around the analysis of a certain class of experiments in molecular biology called high throughput experiments. And I'm going to talk through, uh, I'm going to go over sort of what those encompass, uh, what kind of uh, problems they are. I'll go through an example that is central to my work, which is the expression of mRNA. And I'll explain all of that. So it's going to be really an overview. And I'll also try to give sort of a sense of the kind of research when you're in this field, how your research changes and moves. And it's very dependent on the technologies. And I'll sort of try to explain that. And then at the end, I'll sort of talk about a particular problem in some uh, depth, uh, well, a little bit of depth. Um, please let me know if you're having problems seeing anything on the screen. I know it's maybe a little bit faint, but I'm hoping everyone can. can you, OK, far back corner is nodding, so that sounds, sounds good. So there were some illustrations. They're not terribly important. It was just sort of conceptual to explain. So what, what is a high throughput uh, experiment? So the, the, the reason they're called high throughput experiments is the whole goal is to try to measure something that's happening at the cellular level within uh, for molecular biology. And maybe 30, 40 years ago, you might be able to measure one such example in one cell, uh, in one sample. And the idea of the high throughput is that you can actually measure a lot of things that are going on in the cell at one time. So we get these now data sets that were not available before the 1990s, for example, where a large number of things all at the same time are measured from a cell. That's more or less the idea of a high throughput experiment. So for the purposes of this talk, um, I'm focused on the data analysis. So I've sort of broken in the a high through to experiment into the following parts. There's the biological experiment, which of course for the biologist would be the main point, but that's what, for me that's the first step, is you have the biological experiment where you extract your sample, you extract what you're interested in. It goes into some machine that allows this to be automated, and it comes out with some amount of raw data, which is usually quite large. Um, and then the next step is to take that raw data and to process it so that you now get back measurements of what you're actually interested in. In particular, you get back a vector for each sample of the different measurements you wanted. And then the next step is to try to put those measurements on the same scale so that we can, uh, from different samples on the same scale, which is often called normalization. And then we do some kind of population analysis because we've done this, you can't see in my little picture, but we had a lot of different samples that we did this to multiple times. And so we get something that looks like a matrix often, where we have n samples, we have p measurements. And as you can see from my illustration, as a matrix, n is usually much smaller than p. And then, of course, so we can do standard things of prediction and clustering, various and French. But of course, there's also many tasks that will be specific to the biological uh, experiment. So let me make this more concrete and talk about the specific area where I, uh, I've worked in many high th throughput experiments, but this is one that I've been commonly working on. And this is the question of analyzing what's called mRNA expression. So let me just give a quick background, if it's been a while, for you to know what these things are. So inside of each cell, we have our DNA. That's our static code that we receive from our parents, the recipe, if you like, for how to make the cell function. That code has to then be read and, and start sending messages to the cell of how to work. How is that mainly done? Portions of the DNA can be, are called a gene. A gene has an encoding for a set of letters that encodes. This gets transferred into an RNA which can now go where it needs to go. The DNA is sort of stuck one place. We don't change it. The RNA, we make a copy of that gene. It goes and then gets transformed into a protein. The proteins are the main building blocks of function inside of a cell. So if you want a lot of a certain protein, you make a lot of copies of its RNA. You always only have two copies in the DNA. Okay? So it's interesting to know how many proteins there are or 
somewhat related how many RNA copies there are of each individual gene. And that's what we call mRNA expression. It's just the amount of the mRNA that's in the cell. And you can think for each gene, I would want to measure that. That's the high throughput. I measure all the genes at one time in a, um, in a sample. So what does that look like from the experimental process? So clearly, what I'm going to take from my sample is I'm going to extract the mRNA. I'm going to send it into a machine. And the machine is going to take the mRNA, which is just a sequence of nucleotides that we, we usually entitle A, G, T, or C. And we're going to get out sequences of RNA. So from one sample, we might get 30 or 40 million such sequences. Each of those sequences came from an mRNA in the cell. And our goal is to transform these sequences into a measure of how much of an individual gene is. So the idea is we have some known gene, right? Suppose it's human. We know the whole human genome. We know the gene in the DNA. We get a whole bunch of these RNAs. And we try to determine which of these correspond to this original DNA. And of course, we have lots of these genes. So it's a competition. We have to figure out where the best match to them is, because they do have errors. So that's the example of the sample processing that is needed for this particular technology. In the end, what do we get out is for each gene, so we have p genes. For each gene, we just get a count of the number of mRNAs that seem to have matched to this gene. And that's the vector that we would then work on for data analysis downstream. Then the next step I said was normalization. What does this really mean? Well, and why do we need it? That's maybe the more important question. So we've done this on multiple samples. So we have for each sample a vector of all the counts in the gene. And we could just put these into a, oh, wow into a matrix that's n by p. And we could just work with that. But that's actually problematic, because each of these, these high throughput experiments are compli complicated experiments that have sensitivities and biases that can vary slightly from sample to sample. So I think you can just barely see it, but these are supposed to be box plots of individual samples. And I'm, I apologize. I, I, I will just tell you there's sort of four box plots you might see here, and there's four here. These are all from the same basic setting. They're, I think I took this from a, a, someone else's paper on batch effects, where these are all normal bladder cancer samples that have um, been measured. But we, can see, but we can see that if we look at the distribution of all the genes, in other words, if I took a row of these and I just took all those measurements and did a box plot of them, that they actually, on whole, seem to be different. And this is not what we would expect. We would expect that a large number of genes in the cell are just making the cell function, and that they're, and these are normal bladder, these aren't cancerous, these are normal bladder functions. So most of these cells, even if there's some variation from person to person, the vast majority of these genes should be basically doing the same thing. And so we can see that, in fact, there's differences between these two different batches that were done, the two different colors. And so if we were trying to do this instead, one, uh, we were trying to compare some of these samples to others, we might um, find examples that we think where the genes are different, but in fact, it's just due to these artifacts. And so it's just a question of artifacts. They're very subtle. It's very hard to account for them and know exactly why. We just know perpetually throughout all of these high throughput experiments, and fundamentally most experiments, you get these kind of effects. And so our goal is to basic one way to tackle this problem is to take these different distributions and to align them in some sense. So hopefully you can see that these are the same data, but they've been the distributions have been globally adjusted so that they're on the same scale. OK, and you can think that we sort of shrunk and shifted the distributions so that they match each other much better. Okay? So that's an example of how we might try to normalize the data. And it's a key component in the analysis. And in particular, um, you know, when in early days of mRNA sequencing, I and collaborators, we actually looked at, at and gave methods of trying to do this for mRNA-seq data. And it's hard to see here, but this blue line that's on the top, in, uh, these are lines that are ROC curves. So this is the true positive rate versus the false positive rate. And we can see that we get uh, 
an imp a definite improvement. The black line here is without the normalization, and then the blue line is what we get from our normalization, where here we're trying to detect differences that are known to be there. Right? So we get a much higher rate of being able to detect such differences uh, by correctly normalizing the data. So it really does make an impact. And it can be rather substantial, depending on the size of how variable these effects are. And the larger your data set is, the more of these effects you're going to have, just because you're, the experiment is done many, many more times. Just um, another approach to normalization is, uh, is, this was sort of a global, let's change the distributions to look like each other. Even after you do that, so from this same paper, which is a nice paper on batch effects, after they made the global distributions look the same, if you looked at individual genes, and I'll just have to recreate the image a little bit here, you could still see if I followed this gene and up here, you could still see between these two batches, there's a real difference between these samples. So even after globally changing the distribution, there's still effects. So you can go even further, and these are other uh, more rigorous, um, not more rigorous, sorry, more uh, uh, severe changes to the data, but sometimes, but maybe uh, worth it if you have these kind of effects. You can actually try to take your matrix and decompose it gene by gene, right? And in particular, to have each gene subtract off, if you like, known effects. For example, with a linear model. Um, and we know these are in two different batches. We could try to forcibly align gene by gene rather than globally. And we can even try to search for unknown effects. We happen to know here there are multiple batches, but you can be in other situations where it's clear there's differences, but you can't, you don't know what. Each sample seems a little bit different from another. And we want to make them all look similar. And so there's a whole area of doing matrix factorization techniques to try to estimate, for example, these unknown components and be able to normalize away this unwanted variation. So that's a key component of the high throughput uh, experiment. And then the last component is the component that probably most people get most interested in in data science because the data has been cleaned up. You have this nice matrix. And you can start asking sort of data analytic questions that are of great interest. So of course, as I said before, we can do prediction, clustering, inference. All of these standard toolboxes in data science can be applied to this matrix, of course, with the caveat, like so many modern data, um, data sets, that we have more features than we do samples. So we're in a high dimensional setting. So all of that is true. But I would also say that in this particular area, there are certain strategies and approaches that are common to how we approach such an analysis that are maybe a bit different than are found in many other data science applications. So I'll talk about um, a common example, which is, all, which is called differential expression analysis. So expression, again, refers to mRNA expression, the amount of gene. Differential means we have two different groups. So here I have my matrix and say this set of samples comes from one group, this set of samples come from another group, and my goal is to find those genes which well separate these groups. Now, here that's not super hard. Almost all the genes look like they separate the groups. That's just uh, so that I can make sure you can see the difference in the groups, but um, obviously it's not always that straightforward. And so we want to identify the genes that separate these groups of samples. So I would think that in many data science settings, a standard kind of approach that we would take to try to answer this question is to think about this from maybe a prediction point of view. I have two groups, and I want to identify what um, I want to be able to uh, predict which group you would be in based on your gene expression. And then I would, um, since my goal is not just to do good prediction, some settings it is, but in this setting, that's not my setting, my question. I want to actually know which genes are important and which aren't. I'm going to want to use some kind of method that allows me to you know, be able to go back and figure out what genes are important. So certain black box methods might not be super uh, appropriate here. But, but usually, regardless, you would try to use something where you build a, large mo uh, a model from a large high dimensional space to be able to predict it and then try to figure out which features are important. So in practice, that is not usually done in these sort of settings. 
these high dimensional models. Um, prediction, yes, maybe, but for these questions where you really want to identify the genes, that's not the usual approach. The usual approach is what I would call a marginal approach, where instead of trying to work with all the genes in one big model, for each gene, we do an individual test of whether that gene appears to be different between the two groups. So for example, for each gene, we run a t-test between two groups to compare whether they have the same mean. Okay. And so this ignores possible correlations amongst the genes and doesn't try to build a holistic um, kind of model in that sense. So from that sense, it's quite different from sort of you know lasso with sparsity or other types of things you could imagine. Um, Maybe what it would be most similar to in sort of standard data science literature are things like sure independent screening, which also takes sort of a marginal approach before they build a model and things like this. So why do we do that? <laughs> there are actually, well, it's simplicity. So that was initially uh, probably important for certain uh, people. But it really also gives an enormous advantage in biological interpretability. So in particular, the genes are highly correlated. It's not that we don't think there's correlation. There's an enormous amount of correlation and redundancy intentionally within a cell as to how the genes function. Um, the genes are in cascades of pathways that changing somewhere in the pathway being changed causes all the other genes to cascade and have a similar effect. Those pathways interact. It's, it's, it's very, very correlated in a very complex way. And what is generally most relevant to collaborators who are working, the biologists who are working on this, is to more or less have a good sense of the strongest genes that are changed, even if they're highly redundant with each other. We're not trying to get like the sparsest solution in a certain sense. We're trying to get the most biologically relevant solution. And so um, the most common st strategy is to then, after you find a set of reliable genes, to then use known biological information on them to try to then piece out what's going on in these complicated cascades of pathways. So it doesn't change the fact, however, that we're in a high dimensional setting. And so there are clearly things we have to worry about. It doesn't solve the curse of dimensionality in any way. It just changes our approach to it, if you like. So the standard way to uh, deal with that is to, deal, to think about the issue that I'm doing thousands of tests. And from a statistical point of view, if you do thousands of tests, you know, if it, for example, if your 0.05 is your cutoff, 0.05 of them are going to be found just by chance. right? So you're going to have a large number of false positives. And this is what's called multiple testing the multiple testing problem. And so when the high throughput experiments started to become really common in the 1990s, you had a huge growth in the multiple testing literature to address this and to try to create uh, measures of multiple testing correction for these settings. And further, the other component that's usually done for these marginal tests are to recognize that if I'm doing, for example, a test for every gene to see if it's different, that means for each gene, I'm going to calculate a mean for my two groups, a, a sample mean. And I'm also going to calculate some measure of the variance. And, and I'm going to compare the signal to noise ratio. So I'm, I'm, I'm calculating a lot of estimates. Right? I have maybe five, 10,000 genes, and each one I'm, making th I'm estimating three numbers on a very small number of data. So just by chance, for example, if we think about the variance of the sample, just by chance, we're going to get some really extreme variance values, some that have very large variances, some that have incredibly small variances. And if I'm thinking about my signal to noise ratio, I'm gonna, that's going to uh, uh, negatively affect my ability to see the right genes. Right? So the idea here is um, to use, this is a perfect setting for a type of regularization that's called empirical Bayes or shrinkage, where you actually, even though you're independently testing the, the variances, for example, we assume that they have some common features in them. In particular, we don't think that they're going to be very, very different from each other in a global sense. And so you can have some idea of trying to shrink or borrow information from the other genes to pull those extreme values back in. This is a kind of form of regularization when you do these kind of marginal tests like you do in high throughput experiments. And this is, again, another area that is of a, a lot of research interest in, within the world of uh, bioinformatics and using these marginal tests. 
OK, so that kind of gives you an overview of the kind of questions and statistical and data analytic questions that are very common in uh, and the approaches, which I think are you know, more or less the problems are very similar, but the approaches do have their own world. And so the other thing that sort of describes research in this area is constantly chasing new technologies. And what I mean by this is the technologies are constantly adapting and changing and getting better and asking new questions and so forth. So if you think about like the life cycle of research, if you're in this area, you can't get really attached to a particular technology. Even if you're only doing mRNA expression, you can't get attached to a single technology. Rather, you start to learn the principles of how the world works with these high throughput experiments and continue to adapt them. So if we go back to my original outline, where we can't see most of it, but still, if we go back to my original outline, what I described was mRNA sequencing, which was one technology, not the first one, for analyzing mRNA expression, about in the 2000s. And so as we said, this is sort of the general pathway through it. If we look in the last three to four years, what has been a new technology that's quite related, that's, that's been introduced, is called single cell sequencing. My picture is not helpful here, but let me, let me do it, say in words what should be showing up in the picture. Here, I, I have a little picture of a mouse. So I, I pretend my mouse is my sample. I extract a sample from that mouse. And it, say it's a, a liver sample or something like that. I take a collection of those cells. And from all that large collection of liver cells, I extract out the mRNA and I sequence them. So you can think I get the average for livers of that particular mouse. Well, in single cell sequencing, as the name would imply, rather than taking the average of all these cells, I'm going to pull out one cell. And I'm going to look at only the mRNA in that cell. Okay. And then after that, I do all the same things. I sequence the mRNA. I get the counts per gene. I do the normalization. Um, and a lot of the same questions stay. So this is one small, tiny change to answer a slightly different biological question, yet it, has, uh, it creates cascades of effects throughout the analysis that you suddenly have to adapt to. Okay? So why would, it, why would this one small change? Instead of taking a bunch of cells, I take a small cell. Well, fundamentally, uh, there's different things that happen. One is that it changes the design of my experiments. So again, the pictures don't really show up here, but I have multiple mice I'm going to do this to. Right? And why am I going to get a single cell? It's because I want to look at heterogeneity between the cells. Otherwise, an average would be a great measure. It's much more stable and so forth. We like averages. Unless we want to know how much variability within a single mouse there is. An average is great for looking at variability between mice. Right? So I'm going to have to get a fair number of cells from a single mouse. And I'm going to also still need to do it on multiple mice. Because otherwise, I won't know whether this was just a weird mouse. right? I want to know that even though it's heterogeneity, I want to know that that kind of heterogeneity or level of heterogeneity is replicated across mice. Right? So that's a fundamentally different design in terms of the individual samples I get out. I now have to keep track of which cell it came from and which mouse. And so it creates a different type of analysis that you have to do and different design implications. I now have to decide how many different mice am I going to get versus how many different individual cells. It also means that we get fundamentally just more samples. To be able to answer these same questions, if I had 10 mice before, I now need 10 mice times however many single cells I got from each mouse. Right? So I also just have to deal with more samples. And that's more money. And because it's more money, uh, to be able to afford to do this, I have to make some uh, trade-offs. And the trade-off that's generally done is that the total amount of sequences I get are less. So that means all my counts are less. They still should be relatively proportional to my original RNA, but all my counts are less. They're noisier. And at some point, I hit zero. So I don't get to measure all my genes. Some of my genes I'm going to lose because I get zero counts for them. Um, and it gets so low. Okay. So all of these changes, why does this matter for my data analysis? Well, clearly, this ma the type of design matters for my analysis because I have to build that information in. What this kind of information changes is it actually changes the distribution of my data. Okay? So for example, in the earlier technology I didn't talk about in the 1990s, the first technology, the data was roughly log normal. So I could use normal methods, and that's great. 
RNA-seq, and that's very easy, is what I mean. RNA-seq, you have instead, as I've said, counts. And fundamentally, that's a different distribution. And when I have low counts in particular, I have to really think about what that means. I can't just run a standard t-test, for example. I need to change and shift all my methods to adapt for counts. And what about single cell data? Well, it still counts, so it seems like, oh, well, maybe it shouldn't change that much. But in fact, as I said before, they're much noisier counts. And so that, that is, makes it harder, the analysis. And another part that has changed is this process of extracting the RNA is much harder, because I only have a little single cell. And what that means is I miss some of the RNA for various reasons. So even if I didn't worry about money and I sequenced a whole lot, I just wouldn't get all the cells, all the RNA, while if I had taken all the cells, I would have found them. So this means in addition to having low counts and it being counts, there's additionally more zeros in my data. So that's fundamentally a different distribution. It doesn't match my previous distribution. It's often called zero inflated. Zero inflated is just simply means I have a, the distribution is a mixture between, say, my count distribution and a point mass at zero. So I've just added in a bunch of zeros with some probability. So again, these shifts in distribution affect all of our analysis. So for example, if I go back to the problem I was talking about before, where we do a single t-test for every gene, well, that was a great idea when I had normal data. When I had counts, I need to shift it. So that's not so hard. I pick a count distribution. I pick an appropriate test. The shrinkage estimators, that, took, that takes a bit of work to try to make those work into counts. And then you can see, once I go to single cell, now I have yet another distribution. And so I, again, need to change, have new tests, and so forth. So you get these ripple effects where you're doing maybe some of the same exercises, but you have to readapt a lot of methods and use the things we learned before. We need shrinkage, we need this, we need that, and try to adapt them for new distributions. So then that question becomes, why did I bother? Right? If I'm just doing the same exercises I did before, why am I bothering with single cell? Well, clearly, one reason is because I can answer questions that I couldn't have answered before. So again, as I said before, one of the key interests we have in doing single cell is to understand the heterogeneity that we have within a single subject or mouse. So this is an example. Um, this is one such project that I'm involved in. Here the question is to try to understand in the brain, here we're looking at mice, but of course the goal is to what we can also then later infer for human where the goal is to try to understand, well, we can separate out neurons, and we have an idea of what neurons do in the brain, but we'd like to understand the different types of neurons that might be there. We might like to go in and classify what type of neurons there are, how are they different, and then once we can say this is what this type is, this is this type, and this type, then try to understand what their function is inside the brain. So there's a big consortium in uh, the United States, the NIH brain, as part of the NIH Brain Initiative, and so this is data that we, my collaborators, co created as part of this, where I've, I've shifted the, for space reasons, I've shifted it. So now the columns are samples and the rows are genes. And this is what's a heat map representation. So each of these little squares is a color image of how much gene expression there is. So there's a lot of this gene expression. There's not, this is a much lower levels, where high is yellow and dark is low. And so what we can see is if we look at the samples, there's clearly this set of cells right here, which have very different gene expression patterns, for example, than all the others. They use this gene a lot, while the other cells don't. They use this gene a lot, the other cells don't. And the other cells are using these genes, but this cluster of cells is not. Right? So this is the goal when I talk about the heterogeneity within a mouse. It really is there. And this is the goal of what we're trying to find. And so this, as you might recognize, is actually in many respects a very standard data analytic question of clustering. We just want to find clusters within our samples, though we do have to take into account all the questions of normalization and the distributions and making them adaptive to the specifics of the experiment. Now, of course, the other thing that happens is we get new technologies. We can actually have new data analytic questions, which is, of course, good, because otherwise, if we were just doing the same things over and over, it would, it would not be an interesting area to do research in, um, or it would have its limits, let's say. 
so again, if we're doing single cell sequencing, we can also look at new questions that come up. And that's what I'm going to um, spend the rest of the time talking about is uh, an example of one such problem and, and the work that we've done in that area. So, um, so I said one reason we might want to do single cells is to see heterogeneity. Another thing we'd like to be able to do is to actually trace cells, to follow them through a period of time and understand how they're changing. And this is particularly relevant in questions of development, for example, from an embryo to a full organism, or in regeneration, when we might, uh, under, after injury, how does an organism regrow uh, its cells? So just to be clear, there are most cells in our body do not regrow. They don't have the, and what I mean by that, they don't have the potential to themselves as a cell divide and create new cells. What happens is our body has a set of cells with that potential, okay? And they're often called stem cells. And that they're called stem cells and they have the potential to grow into other things. Usually what they have the potential to grow in is limited, right? If you have skin, stem, skin, skin stem cells, they obviously just grow into skin cells, but they grow into lots of different types of skin cells that make up the, the different layers of the skin. And obviously in an embryo, you have stem cells that can grow into anything. So, so this is an area of interest to try to understand how we go from a stem cell and how it goes into different things. And also, at what point can it not go back to try? And as part of these questions, an interesting component of it is to understand what are the genes doing at these different time points. And at that, at the, not time points, these different developmental stages. And then we'd have an, maybe an idea functionally of how these processes are working. So what I'm going to talk about is a particular um, area of regeneration in the mouse, which is uh, the olfactory system, which is just the smell, the, no the nose. Okay? And mice have an incredible sense of smell, and they have, uh, which, is in, uh, which comes from their neurons and their cells. So the interest here is mainly in how the cell regrows their neurons. In particular, if I look at the full lev level the inside of the nose. There's lots of different cells that are color coded differently. There are these green cells down here, and these are the progenitor stem cells. They can grow into anything. They can grow into all of these cells. There are various types of neurons in different stages of this developmental progression, with these purple ones being the end. They're the functional mature neurons. They don't divide anymore. There's also a bunch of other cells in our nose. It's not just a bunch of neurons lying around. There are also structural cells that you can't see in this picture, but there's some here. There's another kind of structural cell here, and that's what actually keeps these cells in position and so forth. So these stem cells also create those cells. So there are truly basal stem cells in that they create the whole entire set of cells. <laughs> And so the goal, again, is to try to characterize what's changing in the genes as this process is going on. So what the experiment that was done was to, uh, to injure the mouse and leave only the green cells left, and then let the green cells grow, and at different time points go in and do single cell sequencing to see what cells were there, and then also what their gene expression, what their gene patterns were at those different developmental times. Okay. And that's the experiment. So we have a lot of time points. At each of these time points, we have many single cells from many different mice. And our goal then, what would we normally do? Well, we could think what we'd like to do is do, because we're in this bioinformatic world, we're going to do these marginal tests. So each gene, we want to just evaluate whether it's changing as the cell develops. So we could imagine taking for each gene, ordering the cell, looking at how it changes, and trying to evaluate whether it's changing or not for every single gene. This is like the t-test idea, only instead of having two groups, we now have this sort of continuous outcome, and we want to measure whether it's changing over time. So we, there's various things we could think about doing. We could imagine fitting a function to our data, for example, and then testing whether that function was a flat line or statistically different from a flat line. And those that were very far apart were changing a lot, for example. And then we do all these tests. We would correct. We would get a set of pictures. And in our I ideal world, it might look something like this, where we have a bunch of genes. We have our individual cells. Again, the intensity, the color of each of these squares is the amount that that gene is there. 
And for each gene, we could see that if we did this successfully, which this is what I would consider a successful picture of the set of genes, we would have some genes that were highly used at the beginning, some genes used in the middle, and some genes used more towards the end. So that's our goal, is to be able to get this matrix of values. And then a biologist might look and say, oh, that's a gene I know, good. I'm glad you found that one. If you didn't, that would be a problem. They might, you know, and that's these genes. And then they might try to look at these other genes and try to say, oh, look, these genes are all part of some pathway. So clearly the cell is requiring this process to happen and so forth. And that's a total, that's like the next step. So the question is, how do we get to this step? What I described seems quite straightforward. So let's describe what the problem is in that step. What I have as data, if you recall, is I have these different time points. And this right now is just a cartoon. This is not real data. I have these different time points. And this is when it was just the green cells. And this is as the cells are growing back. And so I could do what I just described. And I could say, OK, well, this gene seems to be increasing. Well, it's not bad. Yeah, maybe it's different. And fit a, flur fit a curve, maybe. Try to test whether it's different than 0 and so forth. So what's the problem here? Well, the problem is, yes, I measured them at these different times. And yes, development is changing along this time. But this isn't really the developmental trajectory. What I meant by the developmental trajectory is how it was changing from a green to a blue to a whatever it was to a purple, right? But in fact, while I know the beginning is all green, I also know at the end it's a mix of colors. Right? I wanted to, in some sense, order them by the color, the progression along that development. But ordering them by time doesn't do that. And in fact, at the end, these dark, thing, these dark time points are actually a mixture of developmental order. So I'm losing that signal. If I knew that developmental order, this data that looks kind of maybe OK could look beautiful. That's the advantage of toy data. Um, so, and that's the idea. If I could find this right order that matched, which would involve knowing in certain sense whether it was blue or green and being able to put it in order, then I could then be, do a much better job of finding the right genes for that matrix. And just to convince you that this is not a trivial, that this is real, this really does happen in the data. Oh, no. Um, sorry. I'm going to have to cheat and look at my screen, I think, to be able to tell you what this is supposed to be. So these are three genes that we already knew ahead of time what they should do. So this gene here in light blue is actually supposed to be on in the middle. And this gene in orange is supposed to be high in the, in the end. And if you, well, you can't really see much, but you'll just have to trust me. Uh, you can see it a little bit by the line, right? If I order them by time, this is sort of the line of which the, the expression of this gene goes through. It doesn't at all follow that. But if I order them, and you don't know yet how I've ordered them, that's the next step. But if I order them, then I can see it has this nice progression where it's highly increased here and then decreases. And similarly here, it only increases at the end. So this is a real thing. It really happens in genes. And um, it is actually really important to have this ordering to be able to fix this problem. We have an additional complexity in our problem is that it's all very well to say that I want it to go from the stem cell to the neurons. But in fact, my stem cells are much more powerful than that. They don't just create neurons. They create other things too. So in fact, I have multiple lineages here. It can go to become neurons, but it can also go to create all those cells that I kind of just said, oh, and then there's these other cells. But those cells also get created, right? And so then I have an additional problem that now, if I look at the time points, they're very fuzzy, and they're very intermixed between these lineages. And so what I would like to be able to do is for each cell to not only order it, but say which of these lineages they came from. So in particular, uh, if I take, uh, you know, that this particular cell comes from, the, is on both lineages, this cell is only on the, is after it's already split off and become a neuronal, and this cell is after it's split off and become one of these boring structural cells. And if I do that, then I can see I have this gene that is highly relevant for changing into a neuron, but not particularly relevant for changing into this sesentacular cell. So that's the question. That's the data analytic question that we have here is for each cell, we want to be able to estimate which lineage does it go on, and what is its developmental time or its order. And we want to do this based on its gene expression. So this order, this lineage, has often been called pseudotime, the developmental order that it's supposed to be in. Um, so sorry, 
OK, this is a, OK, so this is supposed to be a plot of a lot of different individual cells. Let me, OK, so what the, the goal here um, is, let me give you some strategies. Um, so there was a, there's a lot of work in this area. It's a popular area. And so there were initially a lot of strategies for if you know it starts at one point and it ends at another point and it's a single lineage. And I won't go into the details of how they differ, but the basic idea was if I, I, if I can find some distance in this gene dimensional space, high dimensional gene space, and if, then, it, then I'm going to assume that that distance is related to their differential order, their developmental order, excuse me. Meaning that you know, c cells that are similar places on these developmental orders have, are going to be close together. They're going to have similar gene expression patterns. And cells that are far away should be quite different. And so if I think, well, if I look at gene, uh, gene expression space, if you like, which is this is supposed to be a picture of. There's supposed to be individual cells in my gene expression space. Then the way that I could, um, the way that most strategies, including ours, works is this idea that if I could find a path through these cells in this gene dimensional space, that that, pa uh, that path would be the developmental order of the genes. And then, uh, and that the individual cell placements around this path is sort of noise around it. Right? And then once I've done that, to get the order of individual cells in some way, what I would do is I would take the individual cells, and there's different ways of doing this, and try to project them back onto that path so that they all lie on the path. We can think we're like denoising it in some sense. And that their order along this path would be their order in developmental time. And there's a lot of other details that are hard coded in. This whole representation of the mRNA space, how you do it, it's usually involves dimensionality reduction and so forth. But um, I'm not going to spend time on that, but fundamentally, it, it can be rather important for some methods. So uh, we were faced with our particular setting where we don't have one lineage. We have multiple lineages. We have at least three that we know of. And so we want to have a way to both detect the multiple lineages and find these paths. and we want to also be flexible to find new lineages if they happen to exist. So what is our strategy? So our first strategy is to, is what I would call step zero, which is just to simply cluster the data. The same example I showed earlier. Find clusters of different subtypes of your cells. And, uh, with, and, and this is supposed to be a picture in high dimensional space where the different clusters are uh, color coded. So you can kind of see there's some color. Okay, so there's some clusters and there's in this space. And then uh, the next step is to try to determine which clusters are on which lineages. Okay, not individual cells, but clusters. In which case, what we do is we take the center of the clusters, we draw, uh, we create distances between the centers of the clusters where we make use of the shape of the cluster um, in, in calling distances. And then we draw a minimum spanning tree between those clusters. We let those clusters, those, I'm sorry, we let the minimum spanning tree between the centers of those clusters help us define the lineages. So in this case, we have three, we start here and we have three ending lineages. And then once we do that, we go back to the question of trying to give individual cells assignments and orderings. And there, rather than using this very kind of clunky tree, we, uh, we use principal curves. But we create a method of simultaneous principal curves through the individual points. So we start ignoring the clusters. We use the individual um, points to be able to shape and determine the um, lines. And that is where we got these orderings that I showed here, which was sort of the beautiful end result. These orderings are the result of taking only the cells that match on the, go, that turn into neuronals based on our data analysis, and um, ordering them according to their path through this line. OK. So just to give you a bit of a sense of like how this fits in, in the global, just to talk a little bit more about this idea. So the idea was building on other I methods. And the reason we came to this was because in single lineages, we analyzed very closely how other methods were performing. And then we tried to figure out how we would best extend them to multiple lineages. And in particular, we find 
if we're trying to draw a line through points, it's not surprising if you're familiar with principal curves, that principal curves gives much more robust estimates than other methods. For example, just using the minimum spanning tree through clusters or other techniques that were out there. So this is an example of what you get if you use all the data and if you subsample the comparison. You can see that if I use principal curves, it's very robust. I'm getting more or less the same estimates. If I use some of these other methods, it's very, very sensitive to the noise in the data. And as I said, this is pretty noisy data. The individual cells themselves are quite noisy as well, and there's a number of you know, bad cells and things like this. So robustness is a key component. And also, while we like using the clusters because it gives us some sort of global structure to work on, fundamentally for building these uh, paths, they're just really not robust. And the principal curves are just really robust even to how we pick the clusters to begin with. If we pick the clusters badly, and we just rely totally on the clusters, we get poor results. And so if we do simulations, not surprisingly, we find that we do well, both with two lineages and five lineages. And these are sort of some key competing methods, each of these rows. And the measure here is basically how correlated the times we find are with the times that are true, because it's simulated data. So one is good. And so you can see that we have very nice performance compared with some of the most popular methods right now. We were also pleased because there was a recent article on BioArchive comparing methods, and we, were, uh, we came up uh, in some of the top sets that they recommended too. So that was nice recently that we discovered that. If we could only get the reviewers to finally go through with the paper, it would be nice. But um, so that's the strategy. There's other various, and I won't go in through all of them, various different details we add in that always come in that make these methods work well. But one I want to point out in particular, because I think it's particularly common and relevant in these kind of bioinformatic problems, is we also allow for the ability to input knowledge about the biological process. So this is a common a thing that happens in this setting where we just have an enormous amount of knowledge about how the biology works, and we're trying to make incremental improvements on that. But fundamentally, to throw away that wealth of knowledge uh, can often not lead to very strong results. So in particular, we think that's particularly the case here. Because if we step back and we think about it, we're looking in this very high dimensional space, which maybe we simplify by doing dimensionality reductions or something. But for the we're looking in a very high dimensional space. We're trying to draw a path through it. And then we're saying, we think that path is going to magically match the developmental trajectories. So there are things you can do to improve your chances there. But fundamentally, it's a fairly ill-posed problem. And there are many ways you can be led astray it, um, in building such paths. So in particular, and so for us, we find that using as much biological information as we can, but still leaving ourselves space to find something new is the kind of trade-off we want to be able to make. So what do we, so our strategy is that, as you recall, I had us cluster, we cluster first the cells. Once we've clustered the cells, we actually can, a single cell we can't say much about, but once we cluster them and we know that these all have the same gene expression patterns, it actually is not hard for some of these clusters to be identified as well-known biological functions. So in particular, while we may not know a whole lot of information about the precise ways in which my green stem cell becomes a mature neuron, I do know a neuron when I see it. There are a lot of, we know the gene expression of a neuron. And so we can look at key genes. And we can say, oh, this cluster right there, I can look at those genes. And I know that's a neuron. right? And similarly, I know some other things. I know these endpoints, if you like. I know at the end what I get out. And I know the different type of possible cells. And I know how to distinguish them. The thing that's unknown is how I go from the green cell to those end cells I see. right? So we feel like. OK, let's focus on the part we don't know, which is how we get from green to all these other cells. And let's make sure that we at least create a model where we wind up with the cells we know we should. So in particular, if I build a, want to build this minimum spanning tree through the clusters, what we do is we constrain the minimum spanning tree so that uh, we force it to at least end with these known uh, cell types. Now, we could find some other lineages, things we didn't even know about or think about or remember, but it will at least start there. And so what does that mean? If I don't do constraints on this data and I build a minimum spanning tree through the 
uh, clusters, this is actually the tree I get. And in fact, it starts with one starting point and two ending points. And what it does, which is biologically wrong, is it actually goes through these structural cells and pretends as if these structural cells can change into something and then later become neurons. But we know that that's just not true. Those cells can't change. They're the end point, and they have to be the end point. So we uh, propose and allow, and frankly encourage, giving information and forcing whatever tree we fit to make sure we have these endpoints. Okay? And indeed, it makes a very large difference in being able to get something that is biologically meaningful in this high dimensional space. And if we compare it to other methods, they just don't provide those abilities. They have things that you can constrain. So for example, you can, you, some methods actually require you to tell them how many lineages are, but that's not at all the same thing. And they don't find anything like the actual structure we know would be existing. So they, like our unconstrained, they like to pretend as if these cells can change into other things. So this is a pretty common example in the sense that we have this trade-off between we have this vast amount of biological knowledge that we want to use, but we still want to leave ourselves space to find novel features. And so this is an example in this particular problem of making that trade-off of putting certain constraints in, but allowing ourselves the freedom to be able to find the rest, if you like, how these different pieces fit together. Otherwise, the minimum spanning tree is not constrained. So that's our personal comp compromise. And it's a reoccurring theme in this type of data analysis of trying to make those compromises between known biology and finding novel things and not being constrained to only find the known biology. Okay. So I'll conclude there. So, I've, uh, so I finished up on sort of a detailed plunge into one particular example of what research looks like in this area. And, but I, I hope that, first of all, my, uh, additional, my introductory overview kind of gave a sense of the types of problems that people work on. That in particular, I tried to emphasize things that might be a little bit outside the standard data science world, as well as uh, this particular example, I think, is representative and it puts together a lot of these components in that it's a combination of sort of a very in-depth, uh, sort of some generic methods like principal curves is, and minimum spanning trees and putting these components together to answer a specifically in-depth, specific biological problem and tuning it and using the biological information to make it appropriate and, and matching the data here. Um, the other thing I think that it helps emphasize is that a lot of these problems, and certainly not all, but a lot of the problems I work on where the goal is to improve and move forward our knowledge of how basic biology works, a lot of these problems are fundamentally questions of estimation and inference. And these are really very highly important tools in the data analytics, um, while prediction, except in certain settings, is mainly a tool in that it helps you do the estimation and inference. Um, and so that's a bit different than certain settings. And there are certainly many healthcare applications where prediction is quite important. But these problems and a lot of the problems I work on are very focused actually in explanatory power of the model. And, um, and it also, as I mentioned before, it emphasizes sort of this marginal approach to how you approach the problem and the tension between trying to add in known biology and otherwise. So I'll conclude just by thanking all my collaborators. This was a large project uh, funded by the NIH and is actually ongoing with additional uh, grants. And uh, in particular, the last part of the talk I spoke about was the work of the joint student of myself and Sandrine Dudois, Kelly Street. And um, the data and the PI for the work was in John uh, Nye's lab, all of us at Berkeley. Thank you very much. Yes, just one question about this, uh, this example that you were giving about the, the spanning trees. Uh, so yeah. at some point you said, well, if I let the method run by itself, I find something which is not correct. I know it's not correct because uh, there is one type of cell that I have identified that, that is not an endpoint of the tree. Mm -hmm. Um, so it means that there is n the, the method running by itself does not have enough data or is not uh, smart enough to identify the correct result. 
what makes you think when you have put the constraint that these endpoints are present that the result that you find is, is reliable? Um, that's a very good question. And fundamentally, I think it's a really ill-posed problem um, <laughs> in the sense that I think that we are asking it to estimate something that it's not at all clear for any particular data set that it will be able to estimate it regardless of how good your method is. And I think the underlying presumption is whether when you work in this gene dimension, uh, gene space, the assumption is that there is that there's a reasonable path and that the distances between cells are primarily driven by this developmental trajectory. Um, so I think that there's two answers to that. Is there's definitely cases where you'd think that there should be something that exists, but it's just too noisy. And if you look at the data, no reasonable paths would come out to begin with. Um, in this setting, uh, I think one thing, and I think this is one reason I really like working in areas in high throughput biology, is we can actually follow up with experimental uh, results and validate what we find. And so for me, that's, that's a joy in working here because um, you, you're not the end answer. You're the first step for them to ask the next question, which is to create the experiment that will validate what you found. And so in this particular case, they were able to do things where they actually are able to sort of trace a particular gene and follow it to some degree, and able to see that at least some of the key um, branches and places that we found them and the genes we found matched that. So indeed, that's one reason I like working here, because I, I feel that fundamentally, you know, when you're in this setting where the explanation is so important, if you don't have the validation and the, able to, the ability to go back and do follow-up, then I think in any setting you have that question. So, um, so I think it's a question of trying to get something that's the most robust, but then ultimately being able to validate it in the end. Yeah. You presented um, a response about flow cytometry, but flow cytometry is just used to separate different cell types, or are, are these actually results you remember? I mean, at some point there was one transparency, and... Uh, the facts sorting? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, sorry, so, that was... Uh, but, Sometimes there's more information on my slide than I, I go through. But uh, that's to refer to, we used, um, okay, so it's let me. It's just cell sorting, and then you analyze the. Yeah, so this was a particular setting of this experiment. The, um, I think you're referring to this slide? Yeah. yeah. So this, uh, I said generally we want to see what different kind of neurons there are. In fact, we already know certain classes of neurons. And they're described as to where they are in the brain, and they have known gene that we know. So the fact sorting was to get down to a subset that yeah. we were interested in. Yeah. So and so this is actually not all neurons. This is that subset. This is the heterogeneity we see within that subset. So it's just a first step before we do the single cell. Okay. Does that make sense? That, that, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I didn't go into that level of detail. Okay. But in fact, we weren't looking at all brain cells. We were looking at particularly either layer. F we, would, we would use facts sorting to get layer, just layer four cells. And then within layer four cells, which we already know a lot about from other experiments, how much he additional heterogeneity can we find? Sorry. Yeah. What we see is uh, in the results of the standard uh, matrix analysis of uh, Yes. So this is only layer five cells. So they've been fact sorted to be only layer five cells. We've also removed some contaminant cells that still manage to get through that are not the right layer five cells. And then we apply the analysis on the individual cells to see what heterogeneity is left. Yeah. Sorry. When you do the single cell mRNA numbers, what's the order of magnitude you get for each RNA? I'm sorry, when you mean the order of magnitude, you mean like the number for, of counts? Yeah, then how many counts for each gene, how many? Because f according to me, it should be dominated by the bursting, transcription bursting. You should just see like a few copies of each RNA. So, uh, yeah, so. If you just see a single cell and you see some RNAs in there, it should be like two, three numbers. Like in, absolute numbers should be very low. That is not the actual case. So let me, let me step back. So when we get the counts, um, you know, it's, not, it's roughly proportional to the number of mRNA in the cell, but there's a gap there. And it's not a gap that we can easily calibrate without outside information. So if I get x number of counts, whether it corresponds to x number of mRNA, there's a proportion factor we don't know there without having some kind of um, 
like spike in that we know at what quantity it was in the original RNA. So having said that, um, that uh, in fact genes I can't speak, I'm not an expert on RNA quantities in the original cell, but I can tell you the data that comes out even after, so there's a process, so there is also a process of copying them to make sure you get bigger amounts of each mRNA. But even if you account for that process, so you only get one for each input RNA, um, which you can do generally, um, you still get many, I mean, you can, you can get uh, hundreds or thousands of, it depends on the gene. I mean, the thing is, the gene distribution of, across mRNA is anything but uniform. Some RNAs absolutely dominate, and they have thousands of copies at any time within a cell. And some are very low expressed. So, uh, so yeah. So it's, it's a very, very, very skewed distribution um, for the counts. And, and you can. I was just wondering, because of those M mRNA which are expressed really low, and they're dominated by the bursting phenomenon. Like so that's what I was describing as sort of the, the single cell, the zero inflated issue that you can get uh, when they're very low expressed. There's, I, was, I just sort of waved my hands and said those were structural issues as to why you can get, there, you just, there's no way you could have captured it even though it's in the cell. So bursting is one of those issues that it comes and goes in a stochastic manner when it's that low. So it might be that at the instant you happen to capture that cell, uh, there was none of it in there, but if you had waited X number of more instances, it would have been there. So in the sense of an average over a minute, it was there, but you're not able to capture it. So that's one reason, and not the only reason, for increased zeros in the single cell data. Yeah. OK, thank you. Other questions? No? I think we should thank Elizabeth for her talk.